You know, breaking a habit is never easy, but fume can help you create better habits. Can't you? Yes, he can. It might be a she, I've not checked. But not everything in a habit is wrong, so instead of making a big, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-winning flavored air device that does just that. Instead of vapor, fume uses flavored air. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavors. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial and is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety whilst breaking your habit. And all you do is breathe it in like that. When you inhale it like that, you get a lovely aftertaste of flavors. I'm using the orange vanilla, which is my favorite. Highly recommend it. It's very weighty, well-crafted, lovely uh, wooden handle there, and perfectly balanced to fidget with. So stopping swimming is hard, but switching to fume is easy and enjoyable. And fume has served over 150,000 people with thousands of success stories, and there's no reason why that can't be you. So head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use the code TRUE that's T-R-U-E, all block capitals, all one word, at checkout, and you'll get 10% off when you buy the Journey Pack today. But for now, enjoy the video. He's a content king. <laughs> yeah. Do you know the True Jordan? You're, <laughs> You're going to decide that, are you? What the fuck is wrong with it? <laughs> you know how they play. What a piece of ass! This is it! All right, welcome back to the True Jordy podcast. Today's guest is the UFC heavyweight champion of the world, Tom Aspinall. Thanks for coming on, mate. Thank you. Don't forget to say interim. People get very upset about that. You don't say that. So, yeah, I'm here, mate, finally. Uh, we know that we've been texting back and forth for quite a while, so it's the logistics haven't worked out, but yeah. we're finally here now. Appreciate yeah. it, appreciate it. I've Thank been texting lots of questions. Me. Uh, what would it take for a UFC fighter to finger you? Oh, um, not much, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love that, you know. Actually, yeah. anyway, it's the most human moment where you're trying to banter back and forth with someone who's doing this all the time and it gets taken out of context yeah. and immediately everyone's like, oh, he's a misogynist or whatever. The Daily Mail are writing articles. Yeah, yeah. What was that like just to go for um, because you've not long won the belt. Well, you've got to watch what you're saying, mate, uh, when, you're, when you're going up in levels and, you know, I'm a normal guy. I've not had no media training, nothing like that. So it's, it's different, like, with a bit of context behind it. Me and, me and Nina know each other. Of course. We were talking off camera about, she gets, like, loads of mad questions on Instagram and stuff, and people are asking, has she been having sex with Dana White? People have been asking, has she been fingered by UFC fighters and, mm -hmm. and all that? And then she asked me something about, she, mate, she asked me loads of weird questions. That's her. No one cares about that. Yeah, that's her thing. Yeah. Mate, she can ask me 20 minutes, literally 20 minutes of weird questions. I throw one back at her just for a laugh, mate, just because I know Nina and I knew she wouldn't take it in a bad way. But, mate, you got to watch what you're saying, I guess. Sometimes you fucking swing and miss, don't you? Mate, and, that was uh, such a lesson for you. It was, was. It was. It was. But I've seen it a lot since as well. Like, even with the situation, like, I'm sure we're going to go into this throughout the podcast, but I'm in a bit of a sticky situation now with the politics of the UFC kind of thing. Who am I going to fight next? And should I defend an interim? Should I fight Stipe? Should I fight John Jones? What should, should I wait it out? It no, doesn't matter what you say. People are always going to fucking jump on you. You know more than me. You're famous than I am. People are going to jump on you and be like, you said the wrong thing. Yeah. Like, if I want to fight Stipe, no, you shouldn't fight Stipe. And it's the same with anything, mate. you just got to... You can never, like, idiot-proof everything that you say. So I'm learning, mate. I'm learning on the job. I think that part of the problem is when you come into it looking like a, a, a sort of a squeaky clean guy, you had a very wholesome image, yeah. and you're very down-to-earth, that you're just there to make any little mistake wrong. Whereas someone like a Sean Strickland is yeah. almost uncancellable because they know he doesn't give a fuck, mm. but they think, you know, you do. Yeah, definitely. Mate, well, like when you see, like I had to explain uh, to like some fa some female family members who are not into MMA and they just see a headline of like, MMA champion sexually abuses female reporter. Fucking hell. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Fucking watch the full interview. When you see a 10 second clip, mate, and it goes like, and I ask her the question, have you been figuring out? Yeah, it looks pretty bad. Granted, like, I, I hold my hands up. That doesn't look good. <laughs> but if you watch the full interview, mate, when she's at, she asked me all kinds of stuff, and I think it's hilarious. Like, her stuff, I absolutely love who Nina is, what she's all about, and what she brings to, like, the UFC. Because a lot of the time, mate, as a fighter myself, 
especially fight weeks, especially big fight weeks, you, you, you ask the same questions, mate. It's boring. So I appreciate Nina for what she is and I appreciate her channel. But like when he asks one back, it's like, fucking hell, this guy's some kind of fucking sex addict. So I don't know, some kind of weirdo, but it wasn't like that, mate. It wasn't like that at all. She she played it perfectly as well. She very much like a Ricky Gervais character. Wasn't yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, She's great. Knew what she was She's doing. great. She's great. Nina's great. I've got a bad word to say about her. So, so going back early on, to your UFC career, it was very apparent very quickly, you're a different beast to a lot of these other heavyweights. Yeah. Uh, this combination of like, if, the, if you were looking at other UFC fighters, you'd be like, he's kind of got the power of Francis, but the speed of gone. Mm -hmm. It's a freaky combination. At what point did you sort of start to twig in your life even, I'm different to these other cats? Uh, it's a great question. <sighs> I'm still not sure. And I think that unsureness gives me an edge. If that if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah. I think that I'm like even now I've just won in my opinion, I've just beat the scariest guy in the UFC in a minute. But I'm still nowhere near satisfied. And I'm still aware that my sport is fucking absolutely crazy, especially at the heavyweight division. Like, in my opinion, MMA is like the most unpredictable sport in the world. And at heavyweight it's even more so. And I just don't rest on me being better than everybody. Like, I know that skill goes a long way. I don't know. I think, I think, I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I think that my dad installed young to me, like, because I've been training with my dad since I was six years old, that this is like a sport. Do you know what I mean? You, you have to treat it for what it is. And what it is to me is just a sport. I don't look at it like a fight or I've got beef with anyone or anything like that. Like, I literally try and hit them and don't let them hit me. And that that's kind of the root. Like, yeah. it's almost like a bit of, it's almost like a game of tag for me. That's how I treat it. I don't treat it anything more. I try not to look at it too deeply and try and get in like a beast mode or a warrior spirit. Like, it's just, I'm just doing a sport and that's the way I treat it. You're a thinking man's fighter, mate. Um, I don't know about that, but I, I just try and see it for what it is. Like, even to my low level of sparring that I've done, mm -hmm. I felt the same way. Like I never felt like I wanted to take this guy's head off. And yeah. I think that that's the cleverest way to play it because in a, in a heavyweight competition, you know, the more you're thinking with aggression and, and, and I am going to bully you, mm -hmm. um, the, the, you're sort of playing into the, the gambling side of it. Mm -hmm. And especially in the heavyweights, cause you just really shouldn't be gambling. Well, I think as a big guy, um, so big guys like our size, they mm -hmm. come into the gym, they're 20 years old or whatever. And, they don't, they're not used to getting hit. And when they do get hit, it's like, fucking hell, I've just been hit off this guy who I'm twice as big as. I need to get him back. Whoa, whoa, and they don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, mate, I've been doing martial arts since I was six years old. I started as a smallest. Like, I started training adults' classes. Well, it wasn't like adults' classes. When I first started MMA, there wasn't kids' classes. It didn't exist at the time. It wasn't, the, the sport wasn't developed enough to have like 30 kids on the mat training. Like, when I was 10 years old, I was training with 20 adults who were in the 40s. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I've been used to like being the nail, so to speak. Like I've took a lot of shots and, and been in a lot of bad spots from being really young. So I just see it, see it like that. Whereas big guys come in the gym and they don't need as much technique as, as other guys because the, the big, they're fucking massive. Like they're just squishier. And cause I started off really young. I've got that massive advantage on people is that I'm used to taking the shots. And when I do get hit, it doesn't, I'm not flustered by it. Do you know what I mean? When I'm in a bad position, I'm not flustered by it. I'm just like, right, I'll just wait my turn. I'll get my, get myself together and uh, I'll wait my moment. That's probably why you move so well, because, um, with bigger dudes, movement is the hardest thing, right? It, 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 you know, the footwork and stuff like that, it comes a lot harder to the bigger yeah. guys, which is why people like yourself, Fury and et cetera, they're, they're the anomalies. But because you've been getting your body used to doing the same thing as you've grown into this fucking massive dude, you now can carry those techniques from being a smaller guy upward. Um, you know, in terms of like weightlifting mm -hmm. and speed training and stuff like that, are you tracking all your numbers or are you sort of not really bothered about that? Um, to a degree, like I know where I'm at to a degree, but I'm not like, I lifted this last week, I've got to lift this this week. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, um, yeah but just, just to touch on that a little bit, I've had some really good coaches as well. Like over the years, I've trained a lot of different places and um, the speed thing has always been encouraged by everybody. I've always been fast and, and I think I'm, not, I'm genetically fast anyway. I don't think, you can definitely improve that to a degree. But I think I'm genetically fast anyway. Mm -hmm. um, 
But that's something I always wanted to to keep up with the smaller guys. I never mm. wanted to like li- let my size hold me back because you see a lot of big guys who just they're just lazy bastards, mate. And <laughs> I, I don't want to be that guy. But uh, yeah, I always try and do it. Even like lifting weights, I'm not lifting weights like bodybuilder. I'm not doing all time under tension and stuff. Like I'm lifting the weights as fast as I can for short amount of reps and, and putting it down. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it fucking shows, doesn't it? Um, in terms of for me, the fight that made me go, all right, this guy is. This is something serious. We've got a real talent in the UK here. Was the Arlovsky fight? I think you showed so many different aspects of your game in that fight. Of mm. um, not only were you, you know, and Arlovsky is a legend, really. I mean, what a guy to still have yeah. that length of career. And you put it on him. Didn't quite get him out there immediately. He had mm. have your, uh, composure. Yeah, and then the takedown and the submission. I was like, okay, you've just you played with him, and you were like, you were enjoying it. Yeah, I mean. Arlovsky for me, he is literally one of the reasons I got into MMA. Mm. The UFC came to Manchester, which is where I'm from. Andre Arlovsky fought on the card and we went to the weigh-ins at Manchester. I remember it like clear as day. I must have been like 12, 13 years old at the time. Arlovsky got on the scales, mate, with these like cream joggers on. He had the fangs, you know, he had, the, he, he had like yeah. a long hair and he put his arm up and he was ripped and the crowd just went like, he's big dude and yeah. the crowd just went wild. So... When I fought Arlovsky, even though like now he's, he's definitely on the back end of his career, he's on the back end of his career when I fought him still, but he was on a six-fight win streak when I fought him. So he was like, he was coming back a little bit, but mate, in that fight, he punched me in the eyeball and it wasn't a poke or anything, but I couldn't see him for most of the fight. So I hurt him early on. When I had him on the fence, I just unloaded because I couldn't really see. I couldn't really see where I was punching, so that wasn't my best performance, but definitely to get people like that on your resume is like... I don't know, I believe in like the rub. That's what we call it in yeah. It's like the rub. And like when you fought good guys like that, you get a bit of uh I don't know if it's comedy, it's, like, it's obviously like a mental thing, but I felt like I belonged after I fought him. Yeah, confidence for you has been a really interesting thing to watch that grow because like I've seen a lot more of it recently. Um, but uh, the Volkov one must have been one that you got a lot of confidence from because the way you implemented takedowns with stand-up was one of the best we've ever seen Thank you. from Thank a heavyweight. You. Uh, it was it, like there was one point where he commits, you roll under, yeah. take him down. That was beautiful, Thank you, mate. mate. Thank you. Um, I, I think my confidence has gone up a few notches since then. Mm. I think that was definitely a good performance, but since I injured my knee, that was like, it sounds fucking weird. Every, every time I see it, I can see people looking at me like, what are you talking about? But honestly, that was the best thing probably that ever happened to me is me injuring my knee. Did it enable you to see the bigger picture? Massively, massively, mate. So like I got signed to the UFC in the pandemic. Sorry, before the pandemic, but then the pandemic hit. So it was like, I was just taking, mate, any fight that I could anywhere. And obviously when you first start with a promotion, you don't get any say in anything, basically. You don't say where you fight, who you fight. Even now, I don't really say who I fight, but... I was just mate, just jumping on any fight that I could against anyone. And uh, I didn't really get a time to like think. Do you know what I mean? I didn't I was just stuck at home, stuck in the gym, going for fights, winning, coming back and then on to the next one basically. Mm-hmm. And uh I knew there was some stuff that wasn't right in my life, which I won't go into too much. Um Is there anything you can't share? Just I, I would just be easily distracted, you know. Like I, I was just trying to I always had in my mind that like, I, I definitely suffered with my confidence because this, this is why well, I've had so long to think about it. Like I had a year off, so I got a lot of time to think about it is I always wanted like a built in excuse of not taking my diet seriously, not taking my recovery seriously, not getting the best training that I could get. Um, all kinds of different, like not doing, I didn't do any strength and conditioning at all. All this like different stuff. It was always like, Ah, well, if I lost, I can just blame it on X, Y, and Z. Do you know what I mean? And that's not the way that a champion holds himself. Do you know what I mean? If And then I thought, you know, when I was injured, I thought like, right, I've got two choices here. I can either fuck this thing off and go and just be a normal, regular person living a normal, regular job, or I've got to go like all in. And I've got to leave behind me going to the pub, me going to someone's granddad's 70th because they asked me and I want to be polite. Like I just, I think I just got better at like saying no and putting myself first. And that's uh, something that I really struggle with. Like I've always been like a, a quiet, pleaser. yeah, a people pleaser, like a quiet kid growing up. And I think I just wanted everyone to like, like, you. like me. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'd be scared to be like, actually, no, I'm not doing that because I've got to fucking put myself first here. And when I got the injury, mate, I decided, listen, I'm going to go both feet in 
I'm going to go balls to the wall with this thing. And if it doesn't work out, at least I can look back, mate, in 20 years and go, this fucking didn't work out, but I tried my best. So I'm proud of myself. And uh, since then, mate, it's been working out pretty good. So I'm really happy. And it is a difficult thing to do for someone like me. Like I said, I was a shy kid. I uh, spent a lot of the time in the gym. I didn't have too many friends or anything like that. I mean, I've got friends, obviously, but I wasn't like the popular kid at school or anything. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to be liked by everybody, to be honest. And, and that's the way it, it was. And I started getting a bit of success and I felt like everyone started liking me more. And I was like, oh, I need to go this place with this person. I need to do this with this person. This person is telling me I should do this. I'll listen to him. But when I got injured, I was like, no, actually, fuck that. I know exactly what I need. and I need to execute that. And since I did it, it's been so powerful, mate. I feel amazing. You, don't, I don't know if you know how lucky you are in a way, because... As someone who didn't sort of get that message earlier in my own success, like I was like, being generous to me is a mm. great quality to have. Yeah. Uh, but you can be generous to a fault, right? And, That's what I was. And I was definitely. an idiot about it. I literally just was helping people who didn't deserve it, just like allowing anyone who wanted yeah. to be on the gravy train, come on, I'll help you out. Me too. And, uh, and it, it, you think you're doing the right thing, but like there is a line and to, to, to realize that and go, actually, no, I'm fucking myself here in the long run. And then you've got this thing about sabotaging yourself mm. so that you've got an excuse. John Jones used to do that ironically mm. before every fight, have a blowout. It's a confidence yeah. issue, mate. It's a, and that's, uh, it's something before my injury, before I had a year off, I never had time to think about this kind of mm. stuff. And it was always like, oh, it's going well so far. So I don't want to change anything. Do you know what I mean? It was a uh, bits of superstitious like that. I was like, right, this is going really good it's a bad time to change something now. I can't be changing this, this and this because, well, mate, there was so many stuff wrong, um, like inside the gym, outside the gym and, and stuff like that. Like I needed to just, mate, do you know what changed me? It's when you lay on the floor, mate, holding your leg in front of 22,000 year old fans who start leaving because you'll, it's, that's a fucking ego death. And, uh, wow. Like that, that changed me for the better. Like it was absolutely awful at the time. Like it's one of the worst things that happened in my life. It was terrible. But ultimately, it, I came back so much stronger. And now, like my career is so good. But not only that, is my life so good as well. Like saying no to people. And sometimes people, are, you know, do you want to come down this day? No, I'm not doing it. Do you want to come for this session? There'll be this. No, I'm just. I'll, you just do your thing and I'll just do my thing. And uh, I watched some something online. I'm not trying to be like, it's no motivational speaker or nothing like that. But it was like a uh, sort of something and it's just like, let them. And it was anything. I'll just let, just let them, just let them do that. Let them say this, let them say that. It doesn't matter. Like I'm doing my thing and I'm going to be the fucking best in the world. And if I'm not the best in the world, at least I fucking tried my best to be the best in the world. So that was uh, the injury and the whole recovery process was super powerful for me. Time's the greatest storyteller, mate, and I'm sure that those decisions will prove that. And one of the things that, because I, I watch almost all your interviews, proper fanboy, and I've been watching like the, the Bisping stuff, and there was a moment on that channel where you were in a chat with Bisping. You were talking like, I am going to apply myself 100% and I'm not going to leave no stone unturned and I am going to be champion. Yep. And you'd never, it all been like very slow and oh, I want to take my time. And then all of a sudden it was a 180 yep. switch flick. And then you also mentioned that you changed your training so that now it was all heavyweights mm-hmm. uh, inspired by the Fury gym. Yep. Uh, and you definitely got you know, advantage from that, right? A hundred percent. Um, and also I go, I go to Holland as well to train with a guy called Rico Verhoeven. Are you familiar with him? He's like the, literally statistically the best kickboxer in the world. Like yeah. he's been the glory heavyweight champion for 10 years. He's unbelievable. And him and their team and Peter Fury and their team. And like, I trained with Peter Fury for a long time. It's all based around the fighter. And that's what I kind of wanted is I, I wanted that. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, as a big guy, mate, you need big guys. Simple as that. Like there's no hiding from that. That's why I was in a position to take the Pavlovich fight because yeah, I didn't have a fight booked and I, I wasn't fit like I would be for a fight, but I, I, I knew where I was at. Whereas before I, I wasn't training with heavyweights regular and I just, yeah, mate, sit like my What's training the difference when you compare the two. In what sense? Like, what? as in, you know, beforehand you were training with middleweights, like heavyweights, yeah. and then just heavyweights. Yeah. How, how does that change you? Oh, mate, heavyweight MMA's almost got its own rules, in my opinion. Like, it's so much more exhausting training with big guys as opposed to, um, like, small. Like, mate, if you're trying to fucking grapple with a guy who's 110 kilo, 120 kilo, excuse me, it's massively different than grappling with a guy 80 kilo. It's just... 
You ha- you have to be a heavyweight to realise. I think mm-hmm. I think um, the smaller guys think oh, it's, it's not a big issue, but it may it is it it is simple mm-hmm. as that. Like I'm a heavyweight, I know exactly what it feels like to have a fucking guy my size or bigger on top of me, and a and a middleweight or a welterweight or a lightweight on top of you is massively different. Then you get the call for Pav- uh, Pavlovich. Who is a scary motherfucker? Like, and, 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 you know, you must have been like, when you got the call, was there a moment where you're like, fuck me? Or were you just completely yes? Um, I was just completely yes, you know. I, I just think that there's not many chances like this come around. And I think, well, I, I knew 100% fact of the, of the matter is like, if I'm watching it on TV at home in the UK, I'm definitely not going to win. That I, I can guarantee that. I can yeah. put all the money I've got on that. So, I just thought, why not? Yeah. You know, I wasn't in the shape that I, that I'm normally in. Um, as you said, Pavlovich is a fucking scary guy, man. And and MMA fans are so fickle. Like, <laughs> I see people now being like, Pavlovich is not that good. Hey, <laughs> come on now. The, the amount of messages that I got of people being like, "R.I.P. Tom. Tom's gonna get. He's gonna get steamrolled in thirty seconds." Because, mate, Steve Perioltrich didn't want to fight Pavlovich. Cyril Gann didn't want to fight. Like, all these guys are turning him down. Yeah. And I took it on two less than two weeks' notice. Mm. So um, I think that just, again, that's a testament to my training, though, I think. Like, I knew exactly where I was at because I'm training with the big boys day in, day out. So I know that, oh, I had a spar last week with so-and-so. He's he's pretty good, and I managed to do the rounds with him, and I managed to get him off in this position. Oh, my cardio was all right in there. My conditioning's good. I'm pretty strong. I turned him in this spot. So that's why it's so important, I think, to train with heavyweights, because you know where you're at at all times. And like having that knowledge of the, the power and devastation that a guy like that can cause, uh, you you said afterwards, I was probably more scared for yep. this one. How do you, you walk into the cage? How are you dealing with the nerves for someone like that? Oh, it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, it's I wouldn't so, like it myself. Like, oh, it's so scary. It's so scary. I'm not even going to like oh. beat around the bush. It's so scary. Um, as soon as like the as soon as it gets going, though, I'm all right. To be honest, I'm more nervous. Like the week, the week of the fight. Like you get to the, especially because like I was in New York, time change, um, all that stuff. It, it's, it's just scary. Is There's, it when you're about to go to sleep? Is it? Is there a time of day when it, it sort of creeps in your head of fuck me? This guy could really kill me. Yeah. Just all the time. It's just, it's just, it's just really scary, mate. I'm not going to um, say it's not. It is. Like I'm scared each and every time I fight. And I used to think when I was like an amateur, and even before I did MMA, when I used to like box and and I'd be having kickboxing fights, I'd be in jujitsu. Come like I've done the full spectrum of martial arts. I'm competing them all. I used to be really nervous for all them as well. And I used to think, watch the UFC and think, look at them guys. They're not even nervous. Look at them. It must be so easy when you get to that level, mate. It doesn't get any easier doesn't get any easier at all but what I do is uh, something that I've learned a lot from the internet from watching GSP GSP's actually told me personally we've had a few lengthy chats about it as well he's like you have to accept fear because it's not going away like fear makes you super sharp and once I accepted fear that it's going to be there and that I can't because I, I always I always say I used to have two fights I used to be fighting my opponent I used to fight, be fighting myself and I used to be like listen just trying to push my... F- I used to be fighting the fear more so than my opponent. He'd be like, I need to stop thinking like this. This is not how I'm supposed to think. Now I just accept this is how you're supposed to feel and this is actually going to help me be sharper in my fighting. Mm. That's something that I accepted a few fights ago and uh, pr- probably a little, maybe around the time I just got in the UFC actually, so seven or eight fights ago. And uh, once I accepted that, it's just given me a whole new confidence. I think there might have been Brendan Sharp who said the, the the worst he ever fought was when he wasn't scared. And I'm, I've heard a few fighters yeah, say that. Yeah. Like, that's when you actually should be fucking mm-hmm. worried because your reflexes, yeah. everything ain't going to be on point. And when you were in there, you're obviously moving around him. You're on your bike. And Pavlovich catches. Oh, he whacked me, yeah. He did whack me. What did that feel like? Like, when I'm in there and I'm just emotionless, I'm not thinking about anything apart from what I'm doing. And... uh by the way, that that's an absolutely fantastic spot to be in in life in general, where you don't have anything else to think about apart from what you're doing right now. It's it's really rare. I've got a really active mind, so it's really rare that I can be in that. That's why I love this sport so much, is because I'm I'm constantly questioned. Like I'm, I love it. I absolutely love that aspect. Is I can find out who I am every time I fight, and that's pretty rare, mate. That's pretty rare. Like people run away from that. And I try and embrace it as much as I can because the sport is, uh, it really fucking puts into perspective. This is like focusing in the moment 
if you're not focused in the moment, mate, you've got to get knocked out. And, and it's, it's a great sport for that. So I absolutely love it for that. But when he whacked me, I actually thought, it's not as bad as I thought, to be honest. He, he clipped me with, he, he missed the right hand, I slipped it a little bit, he got me with the left hook. He started knocking, he knocked my gum shield out a little bit. And uh, I started retreating back and like readjusting my gum shield. And I think that he thought, he, I think that he thought I've got he hurt me, yeah. But he didn't. I was just readjusting my gum shield. So he came forward with a couple more and I slipped him and got out of the way. And I think he was a bit demoralised after that, to be honest, because usually he whacks someone and that's the beginning of the end. So um, It's a but, bad habit to get into, I guess. What, getting whacked? Well, no, for him to to be expecting yeah. you to be hurt because then if the one, like all of a sudden, and we've seen this before, the one guy who can take that shot, mm. you, you shit yourself. Like Deontay Wilder had it with Tyson Fury, yeah. but you know... Mate, he's so heavy handed though. Mm. Like seven first round knockout, knockouts in the UFC against top 15 guys is mm. fucking unbelievable. The guy's an absolute truck. And I guarantee moving forward, he's going to knock a lot more people out. The guy's an absolute You'll machine. probably meet him again. I, I, I'm sure I will. Like I've only just turned 30. I think he's like 31, 32. We've got at least another five years left. So Young heavyweights. You're very young heavyweights, yeah. So, so you catch him, you put him down, yep. smash him, emotions pouring out. Mm. Can you sort of describe what that felt like for me, mate? Um, I was just really overwhelmed. I thought I was going to... To be honest, I, I definitely thought I had a good chance of winning the fight. I thought it would be later on. But I have serious power as well. Like, I know that I do. And something else that I have over the other heavyweights is they don't see the punches. I'm not, I'm not going to give away what I do too much, but they, they don't see them. I don't just stand in front of you and unload the punches. I do a lot of subtle stuff that's hard to see from the outside. I was really overwhelmed, and I think obviously winning the title is great, and like that's my lifelong dream. But also the circumstances that I was in, there was a lot happened behind the scenes, so to speak, i.e. taking the fight on two weeks' notice, i.e. not being in the best shape ever. Mm. Back injuries. Also, I fucking injured my back. Yeah. Also, I didn't realise I was going to New York until two days before because I couldn't get a visa. And I had to be in London, like, dicking around a couple of times trying to get a visa. And when you've got all that resting on your shoulders, mate, it's it's a lot. It's like I'm very regimented with my training. I'm very regimented with my life. My routine is everything to me. Like, I do the same things every day. And I didn't have any of that in this training camp. Not well, it, I call it a training camp. It wasn't a training camp. Mate. You can't train for a fight in a week. Simple as that. Yeah. So it was none of that. I was way out of my comfort zone. So I think it was just pure relief more than anything. It was so great that Bisp, you did a Bisping and that Bisping yeah. was there. <laughs> and uh, he said he went into the locker room beforehand. He did. And then you've seen him afterwards. For English MMA fans, for, for you know, you like me, we watched Bisping take the belt off of Rockhold. To see you guys have that moment was like, fuck me, I could cry just watching this. You know what I mean? Yeah. What was that like? Just knowing that the, the well, godfather. Bisping, he's just, he's he's my guy. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're good friends. Um I was watching Bisping, mate, sat off in the nosebleeds in the MEN arena at the time. I came I came down to, uh, I watched him in Birmingham against Chris Lieben that fucking mate. years ago. Yeah. Like, I was just the ultimate Bisping fan. And then when I'm, sometimes, you know, it's like you meet people and you're like, nah, he's, he's not what I thought he would be. Uh, but Bisping's like... He's that guy. Bit, no, Bisping's that guy and more. Like, he's, yeah. so, he's such a nice person and we have such a good relationship personally as well. Um Michael Bispin, UFC champion aside, it was just nice to have Michael Bispin, my friend there, supporting me. It was great. There was a bit of criticism about the performance. He did, obviously, you got caught, and there's yeah. this thing that people keep li- uh, laying at you saying your chin's in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, I wondered what your response is to people who say that. Uh, I agree, my chin is in the air. It's something I'm working on. Mm. Um, I have bad habits, same as anybody else. I'm training every day to make them better. Yeah. Um, I, I got, wasn't expecting that response. No. Fair play. <laughs> Mate, I'm. I, I think that you can learn from anybody mm-hmm. and I can I can see my bad habits just as much as anybody else. I'm not going to sit here and be like, I am the ultimate complete finished product right now. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like I'm going to, even when I'm retired from fighting, I'm still going to be trying to improve my martial arts skills forever. I'm a lifelong martial artist. Um, this thing never ends. I'm never going to be the complete fighter. I'm never going to be the complete martial artist. Um, so those people who say, yeah, my chin's in the air. Yeah, I shouldn't have took this shot, that shot. I do this wrong, that wrong. Um, Mate, I can see it more than anybody else. I'm my own biggest critic. You don't have to tell me the bad habits I'm making. I love the sport of MMA. I love martial arts. I study martial arts. I study myself more than I study anybody else. And um, I know what I need to work on, and I'm working on it every day. 
has people been changing how they treat you since then? Because it's one thing to be Tom Aspinall, UFC mm-hmm. fighter. It's another thing to have the belt. Yeah. Visually, it, it hits people, you know, like you're the king now. Yeah. People asking favours, people mm-hmm. talking to you a certain way. What are you saying? Do you know what? I just try and keep my life exactly the same. You know, I'm really like, it's took me a long time to get to the point where I'm at. So I want to keep it that way. I'm not into like these bougie parties and celebrity living and popping bottles and wearing all nice jewellery and, and going on this and that and this yacht and doing all that shit. Obviously, I've got offers for that, but it's just not really my thing, mate. I, I want to stay... I want to stay who I am because I'm happy with myself and it's took me a long time to get happy with myself and I'm there. So I just want to keep it like that. That's amazing to me because so many fighters get to where they are by insecurity. Like I look at Conor McGregor, for example, uh, and I think the fact that he has this like small man syndrome thing going on, like he he wants to be the biggest shining star in the room. Yeah. And that's actually sparked a lot of his success. Same with Floyd Mayweather. That's why their jewelry, money, that is their brand. Whereas I think you being a big guy, it probably helps you. You don't have this thing of, I've got a chip on my shoulder because I need to act like the biggest, hardest man in the room. Mm. I am the biggest, hardest man in the room. I don't really have to prove that. Um, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. I just don't... Um, it's just not really my personality, mate, mm. to be honest with you. And I'm not going to fake that. Like, uh, as I said, I'm very happy with the person I am now. Mm. I'm very... Um, I try I try and have like good morals. I believe in like karma really strongly and stuff like that. So I try and be honest and upfront with people and and just just live it like that. I'm not really into like the flashy lifestyle. It doesn't really suit me like it. Obviously, um I like nice things just as much as the next guy, but I'm not gonna go flashing them in everyone's face. Like I'm from a small working town, so um if someone did that in my town, I'd be like, what a knob, look at this fella. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want everyone to look at me like that. Well, I see, I, when I got the, like money, like because I'm a kid from working class background, big time, I had this moment where I went out and bought a load of cars and stuff and I, yeah. I drive them around and I, I was like, yeah, I'm the man. And then like a few months up, I was like, God, I look like such a fucking prick. I'm the same, mate. I've got a Range Rover, right? And and it's, it's, not, a, it's not some big fancy one. It, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, and people are like, oh, why don't you get like a Lamborghini Urus and all that? It's like, I can't be driving around my town in that like a knob, like a Range Rover. It's big. It suits me. It's great. And, uh, I'm just happy with that. Yeah. I don't like you say, there's, there's some stuff that people do and I just don't want to be one of them. Well, you know? well Bisping mes- mentioned on my podcast, he was like, he rang you up going, tell the wife, <laughs> get the handbags out, yeah. get, get the house picked. He did. He did. It's all happening. And you were like, but. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so like you're not daydreaming about possessions. It is about the martial arts. It's about competition. It's about yeah. legacy. Um, but ironically, I was talking about McGregor before. You have had a little bit of a back and forth, haven't we all? Um, he, he sent you a tweet after you said you weren't really fussed on his comeback fight, which I don't think was a bad thing to say by any means. Um, I basically said that uh, he would starve you of your Jim King deal and kill you, you fucking disrespectful yada 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 yeah. um, what was it like to have and I let me be clear a man who you could absolutely annihilate <laughs> within a minute if you do what you want with him giving you death threats mm. a little bit weird because I don't I don't really know Connor at all I've never even met the guy mm. um, never had any beef with him or anything and the, the whole situation came on a little bit weird so my friend started a YouTube channel right because he's my friend he came down the gym and interviewed me and I did it because he's my friend he doesn't have loads of numbers on his uh, doesn't have loads of followers or loads of su- subscribers or anything like that so it's a pretty small interview with a couple of hundred views that's it it's not like a big channel and he asked me about McGregor are you looking forward to McGregor's next fight blah 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 and I said oh to be honest I'm not really uh, I'm not really that interested in Conor McGregor not because I'm Mate, I only really watch the heavyweights and, and bigger guys. I'm not as interested in the small... I just meant it like that. Next minute, he's fucking sending me death threats. Loads of tweets. I'm like, mate, how, first of all, how did you even see that? It's got like 300 views on it. And uh, how are you offended? He but I just didn't... Himself. I just I didn't, found that out. Yeah, or really, he must, <laughs> mate, I just didn't... I was just a bit baffled by it. I was just like, what the fuck? Like, this is a... Uh, like I say, this is my friend's YouTube channel. It's not like I'm not on MMA Hour or ESPN or anything. Calling like them out. Yeah, I'm not, mate. I'm not doing anything like that. He literally asked me, and I just said, mate, do you know what? I'm not really that that interested in what McGregor's mm. doing. And he just got really offended by it and started getting all violent and shit, but it didn't mean it like that. We've had Dana White uh, come out in the last couple of days yes. on TNT. Yes, we're going to talk about yeah. that, are we? He said, um, Tom Aspinall will not get the fight with either Stipe or Jones. They will fight each other yep. next. Yep. 
as as someone who is the the young hungry lion, mm-hmm. John Jones and Stipe are on the older side of their career. Yeah. To me, the UFC was built on the best fight and the best mm-hmm. for the heavyweight title of the world, and it's clear yeah. that you are the best. Mm-hmm. How does that make you feel? Well, so let me start by saying I absolutely love my sport. I absolutely love the sport of MMA, UFC in particular. Like I'm so proud to be fighting for the best MMA organization in the world. And what that represents for me is the best fight in the best. And I'm a massive boxing fan, right? I absolutely love the sport of boxing. I fucking can't stand the boxing model. Like, there should not be five, six different world champions at one weight. And that's at a minimum. Some some ways you're talking like eight, nine champions at one weight. Let's find out who the fucking guy is. That's what I, that's what I want to find out. Like, this is... There's two champions now in the UFC heavyweight division. That's not right, mate. It's not right. Simple as that. You can sugarcoat it all you want. These legacy fights and whatever. Like, my next fight has to be for the undisputed title. Why would I, like... Why would I do otherwise? Like... It's, let's fucking find out who the guy is. Simple as that. All this le- legacy fight shit, I don't understand how that can happen. Yeah, let him have a, le- a legacy fight, but why for the undisputed title? Why are you making the, the rest of us wait? And I understand it's John Jones, mate. He's a legend. There's no person walking this earth who's a bigger John Jones fan than me. But this isn't boxing. This isn't guys avoiding each other. This isn't the number one guy fighting the number 10 guy. Let's find out who the fucking guy is, because I believe it's me. So let, let's see. This would be the first time in history, to my knowledge, yeah. that an undisputed uh, champion would uh, basically not be fighting the interim champion. That like, you always collaborate those two belts and bring them together and, and unify. Yeah. And instead, you'll have the option is you defend it because Dana White has said it's what they deserve. Yeah, and I, I find that amazing because Dana White Me for too. the longest time has criticized boxing. Yeah. And yet we have now finally got to a point where Alexander Usyk and Tyson Fury are unifying. Yeah, in- but mate, two, two, three years too late. Yeah. We don't like, that's the way boxing works. Mm. He's like, mate, look at people like Pacquiao and Mayweather. Yeah. Fucking five years on, who's asked anymore? Like, and that's, that's how I feel about Stipe and Jones. Exactly. Like, I don't care about exactly. that because we've got the champion right here. It's very odd. And obviously I don't want to sit here slagging off my bosses but it's not right it's not right like they can't be fucking two heavyweight champions they can't be this isn't boxing there's one guy there's one face one name and let's find out who that is I'm, I'm surprised that Dana especially because of the, the slating of boxing and like now we like kind of now doing worse than boxing because boxing's actually getting attacked together a little bit in, in that regard mm. and you're saying the quote from Dana is, it's what they deserve. The UFC has never been about looking after people. Like Chuck Liddell yeah. never got looked after. Like, you know, it was killers. You want yeah. to be in the UFC, you're fighting killers. There's no exceptions. Even for Dana White's best friend, there was no exceptions. Mm-hmm. So to now sit there and protect Stipe, for Stipe to deny a fight with Pavlovich, for Stipe to deny a fight with you, and to still get the title shot, I understand Stipe is, you know, he, he's done well for the UFC, but like, you don't get brownie points. This ain't here for like, we're here to find out who the best is, not to say, this ain't WE. Yep. Uh, it, it's it's frustrating for the fans. I, and I personally think like, well, I'll, bring, I'll get on to John Jones's last uh, quote about this because he said, um, I faced the absolute toughest competition the world has to offer for 15 years. During camp for a title defense, I've got a major injury, yada, yada, yada. Now I've got newcomers requesting my championship gets uh, stripped. I'm assuming he's referring to you as mm-hmm. the newcomer. Zero wins over legends. I mean, it's hard to get a win over a legend mm-hmm. when none of them will touch you. Um, zero title defenses and already thinking you called the shots to Dana. Hilarious. My 15 career, I've seen so many guys supposed to be the next big thing. There's only been one John Jones. Never forget that. Notice... At no point does he say, when I come back, I'll fight Tom Aspinall. Yeah, yeah. See, so, like, as great as you are, I'm not seeing any confidence mm-hmm. to take you on. What does that make you think? I'd be surprised if we got to fight. To be, I, I would love it. And you I think he's aware of that you're just too good for him at this point? I, I think he's smart. I think he's smart. And if the shoe was on the other foot, I wouldn't fight me either. And that's not me bigging myself up. It's just like, why would you not fight a guy that's 42, 43? a million miles on the clock and then backdoor it 
as opposed to fighting like this guy who's just steamrolling yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's smart. I don't think he's scared. He's John Jones, mate. He's not scared of anybody, but I think he's just really smart. And um, But scared, though. Scared is, is a word, though, isn't it? It, it, it? It's about, I fear what yeah. this man will do to me. Mm-hmm. And I don't think whether or not it's fear, but he understands that the risk that you bring is significantly greater than Miocic. Miocic hasn't looked... Miocic in his best never looked like you look like now. Yeah, let alone it's, at 40. It's very, uh, it's very strange, so... So if we're talking uh, like statistics or whatever, like John Jones had one fight at heavyweight against Cyril Gannou, let's be honest, didn't fucking want to be there. One dimensional as well, yeah. Cyril. Yeah. And that was his one fight in three years. So he's had one fight at heavyweight. Stipe has had one fight in four years and he got knocked out. It's fucking weird, mate. mate I, but, I don't... Um, th- this is this is actually worse than anything boxing has ever done in, in terms of protecting fighters. Like, because at least in the heavyweight division, at some point, you will fight a live dog within three years. Yeah. Like, uh, th- and by the time these guys do fight, it'll be one fight in four years, one fight in five years. Mm-hmm. Like, how can that possibly represent the best fighting the best? The, the sport so, moves so quickly. I couldn't agree more, mate, it, it, honestly. It blows my mind. Yeah. Um, and and even look look in the Cyr- Cyril Garden fight with John Jones before the takedown, John Jones looked slow. Yeah, he he that body shot he threw away, he missed him completely. I'm like, you know, if you do that at Tom Aspinall, your head's coming clean off, mate. Like, I agree. Um, <laughs> I do agree. And it, it, it's frustrating, so frustrating. It's uh, mate, you, you've covered basically every point there is to cover, and. I just don't understand it, mate. And it's difficult for me to speak in interviews and stuff about it because everyone's like, you fucking disrespecting one of the best. Ever. No, I'm not at all. I want a, I want a shot. Like, I want my shot. Simple as that. I think I'm the fucking number one heavyweight in the world right now. I truly, truly believe it. Let me prove it. That's all I'm asking. I'm not... And I'm not let's tr- not forget, though, to- uh, John Jones' last few fights at light heavyweight. Yeah. He did not look good, mate. I know. I know. He looked poor. Like, going to a decision against Anthony Smith, with all due respect, he's yeah. a credible competitor. It didn't look good. And you, and also, my, my caveat on every John Jones fight up until mm-hmm. heavyweight was, you were a heavyweight who... Drained yourself down to light heavyweight. And if you look at his actual resume, most of the guys he fought were middleweights. M- Michida went to middleweight. Yeah. Shogun went to middleweight. Yeah. Chael Sonnen, middleweight. And like, Chael Sonnen wanted you on 24 hours notice and you wouldn't show up for that. Yeah. So yeah. I just think that like, I think John Jones, as great as his legacy is, it's incomplete without fighting a live dog at heavyweight. And you are that. I'd hold my hands up. If he fights you, then you're legitimately the heavyweight champion yep. of the world because it's the best fight and the best. Yeah. But a win over Cyril Gone, who was never the champion, yeah. does not make you. You know, it's, it, I genuinely, all hype and talk aside, I genuinely want to find out who's the best me or him because mm-hmm. I think he's one of the best fighters ever. I, I literally believe that 100%. I'm a massive, massive John Jones fan. I want to find out. Is what I'm doing in the gym and what I'm doing in my... Is that right to, to fucking beat the best guy ever? It will be. The- and I, I think it is. I believe it is. And I want to test it. But obviously right now, it doesn't seem like I'm getting the opportunity for it. Well, when you look at the way he fought against OSP, big guy. Yeah. Uh, is it Alexander? Yeah. Uh, big, big guy. Same with Dominic Reyes. Yeah. yeah. Dominic Reyes. All of these six foot four guys mm-hmm. who he hasn't got a major size advantage over and strength advantage over, he struggled big time. I they agree. did not have the speed and power you do. And with the, look, he defends well, but with your ability to connect and hurt people, I just don't see a way from to win that fight. I completely I'd be agree. shocked. I completely, and I, and I don't know what to do to get that fight. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what else I can do. I fucking took the fight. Mm. Shortest note is possible. Like any any less than that's undoable. You can't take it. You can't fly across the world, mate. I didn't have a visa. So I couldn't have got there any sooner than that. Um I don't know what else I can do apart from go over, knock out the scariest guy. By the way, Pavlovich was he was a backup fighter. He was training for three months for that fight. I didn't even get a fucking week. So I went over there, knocked him out Nobody thought he could lose. He was steamrolling everyone. If that doesn't get me the fight, what else can I do? I don't know what the fuck is going on. I'm just, I'm just sat. And then they're talking about like defending an interim and stuff. And it's like, well, first of all, who else is defending an interim? I don't know of any. any I don't. I I don't know either. I don't know. And if I've got to defend an interim against a genuine contender, 
then I should be the one with the fucking undisputed belt. Like, not it. like if you Stipe fought, yeah, yeah. it should be undisputed. Yeah. 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 No, he's fighting Stipe, who's 42 or 43, whatever he is, million miles on the clock. If I had to fight someone like Almeida, Cyril Gann, Volkov again, all, all them kind of people who are actually like in the prime and good, like that's a bit of a shit end of the stick for me, do you not think? Like, right. he He's fighting for the undisputed and I'm defending an interest. You know, the thing I really can't understand is the fact that the UFC and all, all all boxing, fighting, even wrestling do this, right? You get the guys with the miles on the clock. They're at the end. They're almost ready. And what you do is you have a change in of the guard, right? You yeah. go, now we're going to line you up against the hungry lion. Yeah. We're going to hope that you lose to the hungry lion. Push him to the moon. We've got a UK guy who's very uh, likable and every man who has the UK audience behind him. I can't think of a better way to, um, you know, attach the star power to you and build you up more than by having you fight either Steve Bay or Jones. I also don't know. I don't have an answer for it. I don't know what else. I feel like it's Jones's legacy is is entwined with the UFC's legacy. Yeah, yeah. And what they're thinking is like, he's the Michael Jordan for us. And if he does lose, it affects the UFC's overall brand mm -hmm. because then, you know, Silva lost, JSP lost. Like, we don't really have a guy to mm. hang a hat on and go, he was the GOAT. I don't know. I do, you might be. I've not a fucking clue, mate. I don't know. Mm. I'm just over here, like. How many fights a year do you get offered? Uh, you're supposed to get three. Oh, in my previous contract, it was three. I've got a new contract now. Uh, what do you have as a champion? <laughs> <laughs> mate, them short notice fights. You better pay. Yeah, you know what I mean. Damn right. Um, I I think probably two now or something like that. I don't know, but um, the reason I'm asking is when I looked through because I've got a bit of a conspiracy theory about the UFC heavyweight title. Oh yeah, in that for whatever reason, in, I hadn't really connected the dots. I was like, okay, Daniel, Daniel Cormier, yeah. Stipe Miocic, now John Jones. Mm -hmm. It is staggering how rarely that belt gets defended. Is it? Com oh yeah, compared to Israel Adesanya at middleweight, who seems yep. to defend it weekly, uh, for, uh, the 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 welterweight belt. Which once would, average at probably like once a year. Once a year, yeah, yeah. Which um, which for for a, for a promotion that kind of uh, you know with certain fighters, you've been grafting your balls off some of these lads in terms of defending their belt twice, three times a year minimum. Israel Adesanya three times a year. Kamaru Usman was two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. So to have it so different at heavyweight across three different champions, for example, I was like, is there a a monetary reason? But they they seem to operate so much slower at heavyweight, and for you to be twice a, a year is surprising to me because mm -hmm. I'm thinking. Let's throw you as many fights as we can. I actually don't know. I don't have a, a decent answer for you, unfortunately. But uh, I have been very active for heavyweight. I've had uh, eight, nine fights in three years, which is quite a lot. And an injury. Yeah, and an injury. Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, the injury kept me off for a year, so probably I've been averaging a little bit more. But um, I think definitely with big guys, see, the training takes it out of us a lot more, just going back to what we spoke about with the heavyweights and stuff. Like heavyweights are banged up a lot more than smaller guys. Mm -hmm. It just takes more out of your body. Like um, if you look at big guys, they generally go into like rugby or basketball or if they're American, they go into like American football and stuff like that. It's not often they're training for like 25 minute scraps with someone in an arena. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's more of a small guy sport in general. I think there's less guys to fight at heavyweight. And I think that heavyweights just aren't ready as readily available as much as some of the smaller guys. Do you think you're just going to sit there and wait for them to offer another solution? Or are you, because for you, your progress right now, yeah. to sit out for what could be another nine months, yeah. then they fight. If they both make it through uninjured, yeah. which at the rate they're going seems unlikely, you then have another six months. Like, it's just not viable, is it, to sit out? It's not ideal, definitely not. Mm. But um, right now, I guess we've just got to wait. There's no... I don't really have a choice right now. I don't know what else I can do. Um, my next fight has to be for the Undisputed. Has to be. There's no... I'm the interim champion right now. The interim means, if you actually translate the word interim, it means like in waiting. So it means like the, the, champ, the champ while the champ's unavailable. Mm -hmm. So... When he's available... Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's not fucking. It's not rocket science, mate. Okay. Is it? It's not rocket science. I don't. I'm just as baffled as everybody else so, with it. So if they come to you and go, we're going to offer you uh, Cyril Gorn yeah, to defend the interim title. Are you thinking you might say no? It should be for undisputed. I don't know. I'm, I'm in a difficult spot to say that right now. 
But I think my next fight should be undisputed. I've never, ever, you can ask any of the UFC staff, any of my team, anyone, I've never, ever turned down a fight in my life and I'll continue to not turn down a fight. But I deserve, deserve to fight for the undisputed title next, 100%. In terms of your heavyweight goal, yep. who is that? Oh, it's a tough one. I loved Cain Velasquez in his prime. Loved him. But if you're talking about the heavyweight goal, I think statistically you've got to go uh, Stipe statistically but I think Cain Velasquez was better than him if, if that if that makes Some any of those sense performances, he was unreal mate like if you compare the great performance of Stevie put on to Kane, Kane was the complete fighter yeah. for me like I, the way he moved he was so good at everything he was just uh, for me he was better than Fedor yeah definitely I, I completely agree um, see I don't like talking like oh if if uh, Kane in his prime fought Stipe in his prime because that's just bullshit talk. It's like the, I hate the GOAT conversation. Not the GOAT, sorry. I hate the pound for pound conversation. Oh, yeah. I think it's absolute bollocks. We might as well talk about fucking Superman against Iron Man. Do you know what I mean? It's, in, it's impossible. It's all make-believe. But uh, for me, Kane in his prime was fucking, he was like no one else. He was incredible. He had this sort of steely demeanor, and then like for, for me, the, the the way he perfectly threw the leg kicks and uh, all of his technique was so there was Definitely. no fat on it. Yep, uh, the the Iron Man that he was in terms of his cardio. I mean, you could argue he didn't have the power of someone like you. Yeah, but he had everything else. He was unreal. Much, he was absolutely yeah. unbelievable. I absolutely love. Never actually met Kane. I'd love to meet him, and he just seems like such a nice guy as well. Like seems dead chilled. And what think of what he's gone through lately? For those who don't know, I'll just explain. Okay, he sure. he got into a situation where um, he found out, I believe, his daughter was being abused by a teacher of some sort. Obviously, as a man would, especially a man like Kane, went after the guy, chasing him down the motorway, shooting at his car, uh, and I think they've arrested him for attempted murder. So, yeah. Um, I think, as a father myself... And I think a lot of other fathers out there and a lot of other men, even without children, would say, that's what I'd do if that happened to me, blah, blah, blah. It came fucking did it. And I think fucking fair play to him. And I think he, he shot the wrong guy or something, didn't he? Is that I think right? The guy who was driving away had his dad in the car. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, it's a shame that he got shot because he was obviously innocent. So that's mm. not ideal. But it's fucking absolutely disgusting what went on. And I think that, a free Kane is what I say. I know he's a free man now. I don't know if he... I heard he's got another trial coming there up is, or something. Yeah, um, unfortunately. I, I hope he gets minimal for what, for, for what he's done. You'd think so. I mean, I've only ever heard of one other case like this. I don't know if you've ever seen the footage of this geezer. Uh, it was a karate teacher who uh, molested some boy and the father of the boy may have been a former cop or whatever and they're bringing him through the airport and there's a guy on a telephone mm -hmm. and he just pulls the gun out and shoots this karate. Oh, really? It's the dad. Right, okay. He'd literally been hiding there for however long yeah, yeah. waiting for this guy and they got it gave him minimal time because they were like grounds of insanity yeah um so you'd think that there'd be an acceptance of that i do wonder i worry about the fact that the way kane looks like brown pride that, that's the issue isn't it? he's to. like see i say all the time i feel way safer in a bar full of ufc fighters than i do a bar full of regular people regulars yeah, yeah regular people honestly i hand on heart like that's how i feel like there's some of them everyone's ego not everyone 95% of people's ego are in check when you're when you're an MMA mm -hmm. fighter because you get beat up on a regular basis. And uh, yeah, it, it goes against you though for someone who doesn't know that. He's like some lawyer who doesn't know really what MMA He's is. He's a thug. They think cage fighter, they see the skinhead, the cauliflower ears and yeah. like you say, the brown pride tattoo and all that. It doesn't look good in that regard. They see that he's a cage fighter, former UFC champion. It doesn't look good, but... Um, and I know a few people who know Kane and, and they say he's a great guy, so I can only go off that. What do you make of... Alex Pereira yep. talking about becoming a three division champion. What? Because that would be a very interesting welcoming. To hit, you know, if you were going to do yeah. the title fight, a, a way to make that spiced up a bit would, yep. would be a double champ situation where yep. he's trying to take that belt from you. Would you entertain that? Well, listen to this, right? We're in New York. He, we obviously fought on the same card, me and him. Never met him before. Never. Um, know a few of his. Um, teammates and stuff I know a couple of his coaches and uh, Glover to share and stuff like we've met before so pretty friendly he was quite frosty when I met him um, and I don't know him personally I didn't know if he was just like that if he was just doesn't look bit, the most bit, yeah he's guy. not he's definitely not a happy chappy do you know what I mean <laughs> so um, 
I spent a bit of time together. Obviously, there's a language barrier and stuff. He doesn't really speak English that I'm aware of, at least. Um, and we went to the, did the press conference. We sat next to each other. He was literally, I was, I was here. He was there. Got off the press conference. And my dad said, oh, like, how was it? I said, do you know that Alex Pereira? He said, yeah. I said, he thinks he can beat me, you know. And my dad was like, what do you mean? I'm, I don't know. I can just tell. I can. I literally could feel off him that. Did he want you to feel it? I don't know. I don't. He, he wasn't. Po- he wasn't posturing. He wasn't like trying to intimidate me or nothing. I just felt like he had in his mind. Maybe I'm just making it up. I have no idea. But oh, I've, yeah. I've never done it with anyone before, and I'm not like that insecure guy being like he's trying to fight me. I'm not like that at all. I just felt like. When, when I heard that he wants to move up to heavyweight, I wasn't surprised. I felt like he was like sizing me up a little bit. Maybe that's just the way he is. Maybe I read it completely wrong. But uh, I remember coming off the press conference, as I, I said to my dad, I'm sure he was like, I feel like I, I almost got the feeling from him like I would get from an opponent before I would fight him. Do you know what I mean? Because like, he had it in his mind. I think so. Yeah. But saying that, mate, we were two, three days away from a fight. Maybe that's just the way he acts right. in general. I don't know. I might have been reading the situation completely wrong. Feels but, like you called it. But when I see when I when I saw that headline that he's moving up to heavyweight, he's going to move up to heavyweight. I was like, ah, that does make a bit of sense. Mm. But maybe 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 I was completely. What do you wrong. make of that fight between you and him? I mean, what a what a striking match it could make. Yeah, I think he's great. I think he's amazing. I'm a massive fan of his. I actually, um, as I said, I train I train with Rico Verhoeven, who's the Glory Heavyweight Champion. He was the Glory Light Heavyweight Champion on Middleweight. So I was aware of who he was before he even got to the UFC. I was a fan of him then. Um, I think it makes for an amazing fight, to be honest. Like if he if if that's something that we can explore later down the line. Um, as I said to you, I've never turned a fight down in my life, so can't be in. The talk of the town right now, one of the guys I wanted to ask you about was Ian Gary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what a character. Yep. D- divisive. Uh, divisive. V- very disliked, actually, by a lot of people, mm-hmm. in fact. Um, what do you make of his skill set and also just his personality? The fact that he's been kicked out of all these gyms mm-hmm. and he's making buzz. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've n- I, I, I wouldn't like to say I'm friends with Ian Gary because I'm not, but I've known of him and who he is for a long time. We were on Cage Warriors together. So mm-hmm. um, he's always been like a brash mouthy out there character even on cage warriors um i think his skill set's really good i think he's potentially a, a future champion even though that weight division is fucking stacked mm-hmm. um and he's getting he's getting the brunt of it at the minute i know his wife as well um I've known her for quite a while as well. As I said, I don't, I'm not sitting here saying that we're friends because we're not. I just know them from the scene, uh, the pair of them. Has any of this surprised you knowing them from back in the day? No. No. I know uh, it's common knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, doc. Yeah, I get you. I mean, you seem like a, a guy who can kind of read situations well and see things coming, as you say, with this Pereira sort of. Uh, Mate, I don't, I might have read that. Yeah. Fuck it, I might be way off. It, I might be way He's off. Coming to the heavyweight division, you call it. He says he is. He says he is. Maybe one day we'll meet. But uh, was that, his coach was actually saying, oh, we, we should train together. After the fights, he was like, oh, maybe we can sort some training out. I was like, sure, absolutely. Maybe that's just the way he is. Francis and Garnu. Yep. For uh, Tyson Fury, yeah. your old mate, um, not my mate, but I, I do. I, was, I have seen that interview. Yeah, I've yeah, seen hell it. of an interview. Actually, one of my favourites I've ever done, to be fair. Um, but in terms of uh, in Garnu's performance, I think he shocked a lot of people. Yep. You shared the ring with Tyson. You've obviously fought at the level in Garnu has, and you know you would have been fighting him if he wasn't uh, for had uh, gone to the PFL. Mm-hmm. What did you make of the fight? Still, two months on, I'm, I'm shocked by it. Can't believe it. I cannot believe. That that happened, and I've seen a lot of people saying, "Oh, Tyson didn't train for it." Tyson's people and my people, as such, are, are pretty close. In we have mutual friends, and and you know, my one of my coaches knows one of his coach. He took that fight deadly serious, mate. He trained hard for it. He trains hard for all his fights. Very, very shocked, mate. I did not know that Francis could do that, and you got to respect him. You got to absolutely respect what Francis Ngannou's done. He stuck to his guns. He stuck it out with the UFC, rolled it out, left, went and got this massive PFL contract. Now he's turned to boxing. He's making shit loads of money out of it. And he goes in there, mate, and fucking holds his own. If not beats, like I'm not a boxing judge. I can't score boxing. I don't understand it properly. I don't, I'm not, even though I'm a massive. He dropped him, so. He dropped him. Even though I'm a massive boxing fan, I don't claim to be able to score a 10 round fight because I don't know it that well. I can score a five round MMA fight, no problem, but boxing, I'm not as sure. He definitely held his own and dropped him, which 
to me was out of this world. I think he's done absolutely, absolutely unbelievable both in the fight and his career and he should be extremely proud of himself. The thing that I was thinking, which you've alluded to earlier about heavyweight MMA is almost a sport on its own. Mm -hmm. Heavyweight boxing is the same for yep. me in that, you know, this these lightweight guys who can throw a million punches and take a million, it ain't the same one wrong move and, and you're fucking, I think as someone who's met Francis, yeah. I was trying to tell all my boxing mates, like, this guy is an athlete, mm -hmm. is right up there with Deontay Wilder and all of these heavy-handed guys. Yeah. But if anything, he can take a punch and he isn't going to just be manhandled. You can't just lean on him. Yeah. Like the classic Fury things that he does. And I just wondered, like, you know, you're watching Francis you're faster than Francis. You can do things Francis can't even, you know? And I, I wondered what you were thinking about your own chances in a boxing ring, if the time ever comes. Uh, I've, I've actually had a prof professional boxing fight myself. Um, that was something I was actually thinking of doing at one point, is boxing. Um, it's something that I'd, I'd definitely do before my career's over. But right now, I feel like I'm nowhere, I'm nowhere near satisfied, mate, with what I've done. Like, yeah, I'm the heavyweight champion right now, but... I've got so much more work to do, mate. I've not like won the title and I'm like, yes, I've achieved it. What's next? I'm like, yeah, I've got where I wanted to go, but fuck me. There's some absolute beast behind me and they've absolutely like the next five years, mate, of my life are going to be fucking a grind. They're going to be tough. They're going to be in the gym working. I'm going to be in fights all over the world, getting dropped, getting back up and being exhausted constantly and going through the fucking pain to get where I want to do, go to be satisfied. And, uh, you don't want the distraction of thinking. About I don't, I'm, yeah. I'm not like I was asked in an interview, um, what like about it. And I didn't answer that way. I answered by saying, oh yeah, like you say, oh, would you ever try boxing? I was like, oh yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah. I'd be interested in it. And then next minute, his headlines out, Tom Aspinall, I boxing career next. And I'm like, no, it's not like that. It's something that I'd definitely explore, especially if like the the money and stuff is unbelievable in boxing. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. So it's something that I'd potentially do before I've retired. But right now I've got so many massive challenges in front of me in the UFC that I've just got to focus on that. Yeah, I think you're spot on with that attitude because like you are just almost... Uh, I look at you like, a, weirdly, a young kid in the heavyweight division, even though you're mm -hmm. top of it. And I think that what you can achieve is unbelievable. Like what, what the legacy you can make, as Bisping mm -hmm. said as well. The reason I just find this interesting is, I think the reason Ngarnu is such a problem for these heavyweights is the level of athlete he is. And I look at you and I see, when I look at the other top guys, mm -hmm. you to me are like the Anthony Joshua of the UFC in terms of a freak athlete. And that means if you did jump in the ring and you did fine tune the skills, mm. you'd be a fucking problem for them lot. I think I've done a lot, mate. I've done a lot of boxing sparring. How was it? It's different to MMA, and I think that a lot of MMA fighters who go, "Yeah, I'm just going to go into boxing," and it doesn't work like that, mate. Punching is definitely a part of our sport. Punching is a small percentage of what you need to be good at. Like, um, it's probably barely ten percent. Of, of what you need to be good at is punching and uh, punching for boxers is what they've done every day since they were 8, 10, 12 years old up until they're in the 30s so mm. there's a lot a lot of differences there and I, I stopped doing MMA for like 2, 3 years because I thought I was going to box and by the end of the 3 years or 2 years whatever it was I was sparring regular with high level boxers I was doing alright but at first mate I was getting twatted all the time and uh, that's something that takes time what was sparring Tyson Fury like so the first time I ever sparred him was I was young man I was probably like 22 it, it was All before right. he fought the click Klitschko. show yeah, yeah. He, he, I don't think he had the fight then it was like after he fought whoever the number one contender was or whatever before then it was after that so this was like prime Fury like the movie yeah, yeah, he was Peter un Fury coached mate unbelievable uh, Peter, Peter Fury just to just to drop him in there he's fucking some coach mate the, yeah. his style is is great like if I ever switch over to boxing he still coaches me now like we still go down there for sessions we're in touch all the time he's a great family friend uh, of like mine and my dad's and stuff the whole Fury family are actually but um, yeah if I ever want to switch over to boxing uh, he, he'll be my coach definitely I agree with you in terms of like a lot of MMA fighters are probably getting carried away looking at Ngarnu. Like, I feel like Ngarnu and maybe yourself and one or two others are the anomalies like mm -hmm. you have to be a freak athlete to be able to have definitely. and like you know, Connor, yeah, he, he actually looked pretty good against Mayweather, but still wasn't good enough. Yeah. Uh, Tyron Woodley, even against Jake Paul, uh, got flattened eventually. Uh, what do you make of influencer boxing? See, a lot of MMA fighters hate on it, and I, I just, I, mate, I just think, you know what? If you're making money at it, 
and you enjoy it, fucking go for it, man. The mm. like the world's yours. Do whatever you want. Like if the, these guys enjoy boxing, and obviously they are part, like they're influencers, whatever the YouTubers, Instagrammers, whatever the fucking hell they do. I, I'm not familiar with a lot of them, but um, I just think if you like boxing and you want to test yourself and you can make money out of it. Go and box. Mm. Like, what, why is everyone so hung up on the fact that, oh, these guys don't deserve... Look? Well, listen, if the shoe's on the other foot and you could get millions of pounds for going fighting someone and you weren't very good at it, would you do it or not? Of course you'd do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't see... A lot of it comes from jealousy, doesn't it? Like, I think that you, your average five and old guy is probably getting paid a couple of grand for a fight. If that. And these guys are getting, you know millions and they can't box and and the guys who are five and oh getting a couple of grand are looking at and being like i want to be where you are so i'm just going to hate on you and uh i may i just think fair play because it takes bollocks mate to step in there under any circumstances one of your old mates is actually getting into influencer boxing i think who's this darren, darren till. till oh we love till we love uh, till around here i'm excited to see how he gets on uh i think it might be in in the the company i do commentary for misfit so that's influence is he definitely doing that because i'm unsure whether he's doing like normal boxing or influencer boxing well i don't think he's going to fight youtubers i think they're going to put him in there with maybe a mike perry or a level like okay, a, okay. A, a tough geezer yeah. who's a real fighter yeah i don't think they're gonna you know have him easy fights by any means but how do you think he will do in the boxing ring? How do you see that going? Uh, Till's got great hands, man. And, and Till has got a bit of a... I don't know if he's like... A lot of fans have kind of turned against him a little bit, but I guess that's the game that you play when you're big and mouthy and, and stuff like that. Like That's his kind of shtick, if you like, is to do that. And sometimes you get on the wrong end of it. But uh, he's had a bit of a bad run in the UFC. His, his body was in awful shape. Like his knees were smashed and everything. Yeah. Um, and he's got great... Till's got some... Good hands, man. Some good hands. And I'm sure that when he... I've not seen him train for a while. I know he's been at the boxing for a couple of years now, so I don't know. But even before any of that, like he's been a lifelong Thai boxer. He's yeah. been Thai boxing since he was like eight, nine years old or something. He's now in his 30s. So, mate, the guy can definitely throw a punch. He can punch hard and I think that he'll do well. Definitely. I look at his last fight in the UFC mm -hmm. against uh, uh, Drakus, yeah. And he got, you know, oh, Till loses again. Mm -hmm. He got you a lot of shit for it. Yeah. And now looking back at it, you're like, you nearly fucking had him mm -hmm. You know, gone. Mate, well, Till's good, mate. Yeah. Till's good. That that's aged like a fine wine. That fight. Yeah. Like it, I think a lot of people were harsh on him for that, and now you know, um, Drickus is fighting for the title. Yeah. So like, how how far away from the top is Till? I, I kind of wish he'd stuck at the UFC and not gone mm. boxing, but I guess we'll find out once he makes the cash if he wants to come. I look forward to it, mate. I'll tune in, and uh, if possible, I'll be there live watching it. I, I support Till, and. Uh, yeah, I think he'll he'll do just fine, mate. I'm sure he'll do just fine. I want to talk about your dad a bit because mm -hmm. he obviously you've mentioned him a couple of times, and we see in this moment where you put the belt on him in the kids' proper heartwarming moment. But your dad, like yourself, is kind of um, he's not trying to hog the limelight. He was very much like, okay, mm -hmm. thanks very much. What 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 has it been like on this journey between you and him? For yeah, well. Son? Fucking good luck getting my dad on an interview or in a picture because he don't like any of that stuff. He likes it. I mean, I don't mind it. I'm, I'm, it's growing on me now, I guess. I guess I've got to embrace it a bit, but my dad don't want to, he don't want his face on the camera. He don't want to be mentioned. He's not bothered about any of that kind of stuff, mate. My dad got me into the, the sport of martial arts. I say all the time, mate, if my dad rung me, if I came out of this podcast right now, my dad rung me and went, Tom, uh, I think you should sack this MMA off and do something else. I'd go, no worries. And I'd retire right there. That's that. That's that. Wow, you trust him so. That's how much my dad means to me um, in the sport and in general as well. Um, like he got me into the sport. He's been at every training session since, all around the world. He's, he's trained with me. We've been to loads of top top level gyms, mate. And I always train with. Uh, you know, I train MMA in the morning, and I, me and my dad would do technique in the afternoon every day, every day for twenty two years. That must have been hard for him, though, because I know he was a jiu-jitsu expert. Yeah. But then he's also having to learn things to then relay them to you, I'm assuming. Well, mate, he, he, he's had boxing fights as a kid. He's done Thai boxing. He's done a full spectrum of martial oh, well. arts himself. So, yeah, he's definitely a UK BJJ pioneer. He's one of the first black belts to come out of the UK ever. But he's done all martial arts as well. And, mate, the guy studies, like, studies the game unbelievably. He's got such a good mind. And I'm so blessed to have that guy because if it wasn't for him, I, don't, I wouldn't have even made it to the UFC. As I say, every day, mate, every single day from me being eight years old, we have practiced technique in my dad's garage up until now that I'm 30. <laughs> and we still like do it. We still, mate, I'll go and spar in the morning. 
And then we'll go and break it down in the afternoon, right? You need to do a bit more of this. You need to do, right, I've seen this video. This guy's doing this. You need to practice this. Put your foot there. Little tweak, make little tiny tweaks and make them with the most boring, mundane sessions that anybody has ever seen. Like you can't do them sessions with 10 guys and it doesn't work. No one's going to do it. Just for me doing it. Like he'll, he'll have me stepping my foot there, stepping across and turning it like that for 40 minutes. L- literally just that. And if I, if I turn it there and I'm a bit off, I'll, it'll make me go back and do it again until I've got it right and that has been mate and a lot of people don't see this it's why, why I want to mention it and uh, every fucking day since I was eight years old we have been practicing stuff like right this hand goes there boom when you punch you got to bring it back slip off Stu- mate stuff like that has been practiced for hours upon hours upon hours and if I've not got it right he'll be the one telling me to do it again and if he didn't tell me to do it again I wouldn't be doing it again so say he doesn't want to stick his face in the camera he doesn't want a load of credit for it or nothing like that but mo- a lot a lot of strong part of why I do martial arts is because of him this it, it's just a, a, a complete formula for success when you are willing to go over the mundane yeah. boring details every day but mate it's only my dad who could tell me to do it because I won't be listening to anybody else like that he that, knows you he knows me mm. and he knows when I've had enough and we check in all the time and yeah, he knows when to push and when not to push. And that's something that I just can't have with uh, somebody else, really. Have you ever had, like, I don't know, heated moments? Oh, plenty. Mate. Yeah. Loads, loads. Absolutely. Yeah. Any, any, anyone that springs to mind where you were like, fuck me, that was a, a born burnout? Because to uh, get to this level of success, you have to challenge each other. You have to be pushing. And like teammates do in football matches. Yeah, yeah. They scream at each other, don't they? Like, Well, we, we've had a lot. Lot, mate. Lot. <laughs> Fucking loads. <laughs> Fucking loads. Um, the main ones is being like, um, again, going back to what we spoke about before, like me being a people pleaser and stuff. It's mainly like people dragging it, right, come over here and train with me. We'll do a bit of this, this and this. And he's like, that's fucking wrong what you're doing. Like um, before I was training with heavyweights, he was on me like, he'd come to a training session, like an MMA session that I'd be doing in the morning. There'd be no heavyweights there. And he, he'd be like, Tom, we'd get in the car after. He'd be like, what are you doing there? He's fucking shite. Why are you doing it like this? I'd be like, I don't know. That's that's how I do it. And then he'd be like, you need someone to test you in the gym. Like you need to, like he just hit me with a reality check like that, which is something that a stranger or someone you don't know as well can't really do. Like he'd be like, what are you doing there? It's fucking terrible. Like you can't be doing that. You need to be training with heavyweights who are going to put you in your place when you do stuff like that, which is why we now train with heavyweights. Is he the main guy in the corner or do you have, because uh, yeah, he's, he's barely uh, get to the corner. Yeah, <laughs> good. I don't want to fucking get to the corner if I don't have to. Because <laughs> we never see you get a pep talk yeah. after a first round because it just doesn't get there. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of you just being a family man as well, um, uh, you're married how many kids you got three yeah you got three kids uh, what are you what are you like with the husband what's the, what's the you and your missus like together what's your great. relationship like great she's great um, we're talking about my dad not liking the limelight she hates it even more so. well I heard stories because it was very funny because she wasn't there for the fight yeah she wasn't there so um, we have three children I won't go into it too much because she gets it uncomfortable so um, one of my children has autism mm. so um, to pull that off and get childcare on like a week's notice and her to fly across the world for multiple days is unfeasible. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, she was asleep, man. She's she's she was asleep. So I was trying to call her and stuff, but she wasn't answering. She was asleep because of the time difference. And uh, yeah, I got through to her, and she was happy, of course. And you, you've mentioned uh, your child has autism. Mm-hmm. I, I've got family members with autism. I mm-hmm. think it was great that you brought Thank that you, up mate. because there isn't enough awareness. You see people banding this word about in a negative way, and the lack of understanding. Yeah. And look, who, no one teaches you about autism at school. We we just sort of hear the word and we don't really know what it means until you actually interact with someone what has it been like for you as a, as a dad educating yourself finding out more about it and how have you coped with it um first of all thanks for asking because i always like to try and take the opportunity to speak about it publicly when mm. i can and it's not something that's very easy for me to speak about because still my, my child's only just turned four so i'm, I'm in the infancies mm. of understanding autism and i don't want to come out and claim that I know stuff, everything about autism because I don't. I, I'm I'm happy to say that I definitely don't. Um, there's people, there's adults who have grown up with autism. Obviously, there's people now, sixty, seventy year old people who are still caring for the children who are in the forties and fifties now who've got autism. So mm. I can't preach on it too much. It varies a lot. It, it's massive. Yeah. Mate, the spectrum is massive. The spectrum is absolutely enormous. Mm. Um, but what I want to try and do with my platform 
that I've got is just try and get awareness of, about kind of just because a, a kid might be messing around and, and crying in public and stuff like that. Mate, a lot of the time the parents are just as uncomfortable as anybody else. Like me as a parent, especially before we got the diagnosis, uh, my kid was acting up in public and, and crying and being in uncomfortable situations that me or you wouldn't be uncomfortable with. But um, it made him uncomfortable and we weren't aware of it at the time. And it's not always because the child's naughty or they've got shit parents, the reason why the kid's acting up. Do you know what I mean? So I, th- I just want people to know about that a little bit more. And From my understanding, a lot of the time with kids, it's the frustration that they're not exactly. able to express yep. themselves in a way that other children can. Exactly. And it comes out in this way. Exactly. And other par- like other parents may be looking at their child like, oh, he's misbehaving and looking in a way of, oh, can you not keep your kid under control? Yeah, exactly. And that's the that's the lack of awareness that yeah, yeah. you're mentioning there. Well, a few times I'd, I'd be taking my kid in public and, you know, it's just small stuff like they can't explain to you, especially a three-year-old kid that they want a specific toy Mm -hmm. in in a supermarket and they can't understand that they can't pick that toy up and take it home with them. And you can't explain it to you. Try, Mm -hmm. you try. And they've been a lot. Yeah. It's it's heartbreak, screaming, Mm -hmm. crying, paddy and all the rest of it. And there's been a few times I've I've had that situation in a supermarket and some woman, uh, some women have walked past me and, you know, give me a dirty look and a, a couple of comments here and there. Like, Oh, it'd be easier if his mum was here. And it's like, no, it's fucking not about that. Uh, it's yeah. about the fact that, you know, it's just it's just hard, mate. And I just want to raise as much like autism and awareness as I can. And I did a couple of posts about it on Instagram. And I'm not trying to drop anyone in it here, but I've got so many messages of people in the public eye who have got autistic children who I had no idea that they had autistic children. Uh-huh. And I just wish people in the public eye would talk about it a little bit more because I actually... The whole reason I got my son diagnosed was because of Paddy McGuinness, actually. So I watched his documentary on autism. He has three autistic children. And it was, I looked at some of them. I was like, that sounds quite familiar. A lot of the stuff that, a lot of the symptoms that he's going through. Mm -hmm. And coincidentally, I met him. at at We was on a question of sport. did a question of sport. He was the host on it. And I asked him about it. And he said, mate, get a diagnosis as quick as you can. That's the the main thing to do. And I said, we're trying to get a diagnosis, but we're on the NHS. Luckily, I'm in a financial position where I could pay privately. But mate, the waiting list now to get a diagnosis is fucking massive, like two, three years to even get your kid looked at. It's horrendous because this, my mum works in a school, mate, and there's more and more autistic people and more and more ADHD kids and, and all that kind of stuff coming through each year. And it's just massive now it's so big to get, get get a diagnosis and the thing is mate when you get a diagnosis that's when you can get help mm-hmm. so because as you said the spectrum is massive mate it, it can be something that's it can go from someone not being able to explain the feelings properly to somebody not being able to walk and talk ever mm-hmm. so it's massive it's absolutely massive and i just want to get as much help and, and the word out there as possible on, on autism yeah, um, the heartbreaking thing from from my understanding as well is what you've just perfectly said is the lack of um, uh, the lack of ability right now in public uh, health council and all of that to actually take care of these kids. Meanwhile, yeah. we're sending trillions to other countries who are in war and all these problems, and yet we've got waiting lists like this for mm-hmm. our own children. Yeah, uh, it, it's a disgrace, and and um, and it, it it's nowhere near good enough, really, for what they deserve. Yeah, uh, but like, well done, mate, and uh, I, I really love what you're doing, and I think um, they've obviously got their uh, symbol. There's like the, this jigsaw piece that is yep. the symbol of autism, and it's just great that more people are posting about this and more people are talking about it, and. The heavyweight champion of the world is a big Thank deal. Thank you, mate. Thank you. And I'm not, I'm, I don't, I'm always pretty sensitive of kind of what I put out and what I say. And I don't want to say the wrong thing because I'm really new to it. I'm super new to it. Like we've had the diagnosis just over a year. My kid is obviously really, really young at this point, And mm-hmm. I don't know a lot of the questions that are getting thrown my way. And I don't feel educated enough on the subject mm-hmm. to speak about it a lot of the time. But all I want to get out there is that. There's autistic people out there and just please don't be so quick to judge when a child is misbehaving. That, that's it. That's all I can offer right now. But uh, hopefully as the years go on, I'll uh, I'll get more more stuff out there. That brings us on to the final question. Okay. Uh, that's you, bro. How would you like to be remembered? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I'm not the kind of guy, the guy, kind of guy who likes to think too much in the future. I try not to. I try and live in the moment as much as I can. That being said, I want to be the guy who was one 
known as a fan favourite. I think that's really important. Someone that put on exciting fights because ultimately that's what this sport's about. That's why we watch it because it's exciting. And I want I want people to look at it and not be like, I'm going to watch him because I want to watch him lose. Oh, he's been, he's been saying this in the press conference and he's been saying, don't interest me, mate. I want people to watch and go, fucking hell, there's going to be some masterclass on here. Like someone's going to get knocked out and I want to tune in for it. That's why I want people to watch from a martial arts perspective. So that first of all, and I want to go down as the best heavyweight ever. Well, mate, as long as you don't run from challengers like some champions that we know, yep. I'm pretty sure that'll happen. Yep. I that was so. Tom Aspinall on the True Geordie podcast. Big love, big thanks. And I'll see you on the next one. Cheers. 